Ei. Etä. Shame I can't be there in person, but... Yeah, I'm all good. Uh, can you see... I've got a slide deck open. Can you see that? That's it. All right, okay. Hello, everybody. Um, as I said, it's a shame I can't be there in person. I was hoping this would be my first uh, crypto get together, but sadly, uh, COVID's um, conspired against me. It would have been great to catch up with many of you, many friends there. Um, so, for those that don't know me, I'm Jamie Burke. I'm from Outlier Ventures and founder and CEO. And uh, we describe what we do as accelerating the open metaverse. And I'm going to explain what I mean by the open metaverse and why I think it's important that we are thinking about what we're doing with Web3 in that context over the course of the presentation. Um, quick disclaimer, just because we're regulated um, in the financial services industry as an investor, as an accelerator, nothing here is investment advice. So do with that what you will. Um, so for those that don't know us, uh, we've been around since 2014. Um, since 2017 alone, we've made 70 investments. We'll have 100 by this fall. Um, and we were one, if not the most active investor in Europe during the last bear market by volume, not by deal size. Um, I don't know whether you'd call this a bear market or not, but we believe we'll also be the, the most active in this one too. Uh, and by that, I mean, we're effectively evergreen. So we invest irrespective of the cycles. We all love a bull run as much as anybody else, um, but we're as active um, in a bear market as we are in a bull market. Um, and you know, this, this year, we'll probably speak to about 2000 startups plus uh, who will apply to join our accelerator program. Um, and from this year onwards, we'll be investing in at least 100 startups a year. So um, within the next 12 months, we'll double um, what we did over our entire life cycle. So we're growing um, at a great rate. And I think that's really representative of the ecosystem, the health of the ecosystem, the health of the venture ecosystem, and the health of the early stage ecosystem. Um, and we've helped launch uh, lots of different networks, seven, in the last 12 months and we're now at stage where we'll be launching one or two a month again irrespective of the market conditions um so that's as much uh me telling you about the market as it is me telling you about outlier um so before we get into the metaverse the open metaverse and what i propose is the open metaverse os operating system um it's worth just taking some minutes to reflect on the last 10 years of Web3. Um, and then I'm going to move through that into the metaverse of this today. I'm going to try to define it. Um, and in that context, I'm going to look at how Web3 as an infrastructure can allow it to be more open. It can um, serve as an operating system for a more open metaverse. Um, I'm going to talk about where I believe the low hanging fruit is for the open metaverse OS and in particular DeFi. Um, and it's perhaps not where most people think it is. Uh, and then finally, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Basecamp if I have time, how you can apply to work with us um, to accelerate this open metaverse OS. So first, reflecting on 10 years of, of Web3, um, I'm sure many of you are already fairly familiar with, if not this entire thing, what you would refer to as a Web3 stack or toolbox, at least elements of it, hopefully you're already deploying uh, aspects of it within your own applications if you're a startup. Um, but effectively, we've we've kind of you know, realized this Web3 stack that's kind of finally coming into its own. Um, and a lot of the use cases that were promised when I first joined into the crypto space that were kind of concepts are now um, becoming a reality. Um, and again, especially so in what I refer to as the metaverse and the open metaverse. Um, 
equally, you know, we're reflecting back on the last 10 years. And of course, we're now, um, we've, we've just suffered another market correction, albeit, I believe, one that was overdue. Um, the same could be uh, said for 2017. And I know a lot of people look back on 2017 with uh, a lot of negative feelings. Um, and of course, there was a lot of um, scams and, and various other things that happened. But I think there's this general sense that somehow there was this massive misallocation of capital. Um, and a lot of it was uh, ineffective and therefore it went to waste. And I would argue that's not true. Um, especially when you look at it in a venture context, 90% of startups fail at, uh, tr traditionally um, in a venture model. And I would argue that out of uh, 2017 and the whole ICO mania, we have a huge amount of open source technology that would have not otherwise been open source um, and that is now being kind of combined into this highly composable Web3 stack. Um, I would also argue that we now have, um, whilst of course a huge amount of development and activity is, is still centered on Ethereum, we have the beginnings of um, activities on other protocols that I believe are complementary and of course increasingly uh, interoperable. Um, and so in combination, what all of that equals really is, is two things in my mind. Um, a kind of bottom-up proto-capital market, which of course we refer to as DeFi, um, but then also with the event of NFTs, kind of a, a native, for, so if, if that is like a native form of money and native capital market to the internet, then NFTs represent a kind of native social media um, for the internet and the web without a platform, without a social media platform. Um, and those two things are very powerful, um, especially in combination, NFTs plus DeFi. I'm going to talk a little bit later about how um, that forms part of our thesis when looking at the metaverse. But more importantly than all of that is the principles that um, we've managed to seed into all of this infrastructure, this open source infrastructure that's centered around um, self-sovereign identity and self-sovereign data and self-sovereign wealth and a digital form of wealth. And so if people adopt this infrastructure, they have to adopt those principles, if not in whole, in part. And again, I think this is a huge achievement for uh, the last 10 years. And you know, many of you have participated in that. And I think now we're going to see that really come into its own. So what is the metaverse today? You know, if you Google or go into YouTube and try to find a coherent explanation for what is the metaverse, it's actually very difficult. Um, and often you've kind of got competing, conflicting definitions. So I'm going to take a stab at giving you my definition. And of course, that is uh, significantly influenced by uh, other thoughts, uh, especially coming out of science fiction, 80s science fiction. But effectively, if I were to try to come up with a really simple description of what is the metaverse uh, in, in a singular, it is the interface layer, both a combination of software and hardware that makes the physical and the virtual or the digital indistinguishable, kind of one and the same from an experience perspective. Um, and if you go back to science fiction, it actually, and you try to find out kind of common threads um, on defining the metaverse, it seems that the defining characteristic of the metaverse, or a metaverse, was that somehow it was an economic system independent of and that enjoyed supremacy to old fiat-based economies controlled by nation states. Now, of course, if you go to something like Ready Player One, and of course, you know, Snow Crash, but uh, I think Ready Player One really brings it to life, you have a single corporation that wants to own and control the Oasis servers and databases to have the ability to be able to delete people. So, you know, uh, deplatform people, access any information, change the rules of, of the world, the T's and C's about how users engage with it and print themselves infinite currency. And actually, if you think about that, it sounds a lot like the web today, let alone this future vision of the metaverse. That sounds like the web, it sounds like 
gaming and most gaming platforms. It sounds like how we experience the internet um, today. And, you know, I think that's really telling because one of the problems when people start talking about the metaverse, and of course it's only really been, it's only really re-emerged in the last couple of years, um, they're often talking about it as some far off destination. And I think that's really dangerous because if we think of it as a far off destination, then we're more likely, in fact, I would say guaranteed to sleepwalk into um, either extending the web to paradigm into the metaverse um, at, or potentially deepening it. Um, and it's that deepening part, which is, which is also very worrying because we are kind of at an inflection point. So I'll talk about that a little bit later. It's also really telling that probably the one person who has the most to gain from that dystopic um, vision of a metaverse or the metaverse, which is really a process of capture and control, is, is this statement that he made here. You know, he says that the metaverse is going to be far more pervasive and powerful than anything we've seen. And if one company gains control of this, they'll become more powerful than any government or God on earth. Now, as the person that runs the company that has maybe the best shot to do that, you would think, well, why, why would he be saying that? Surely his shareholders are going to be pissed off. Well, you know, he's seen Ready Player One for starters, and he knows that companies uh, have a life cycle beyond their founder, and therefore he's probably as concerned about the legacy he leaves behind as, as to what's in front of him right now. Um, and so the point around why this is really important now, why Tim Sweeney thinks it's really important right now, and he just announced a billion dollar fund specifically to help Epic and Unreal transition to become more open and to support a more open metaverse. We've had personal dealings with him through, um, not Tim personally, but Epic through our accelerator, um, where they are giving grants to projects working in the open metaverse, non-equity grants. Um, so they're really kind of committed to this vision. Um, and the reason why this is important is if you think about the hardware component um, of that definition of the metaverse, um, we are increasingly through things like VR and AR bolting things onto our head that can effectively go inside our body. So rather than them capturing biological data you know, through us being click monkeys, like how we respond to content on the internet, they can actually even now see how your retina reacts to visual stimuli. So it can see your emotional responses before you're even aware of them, maybe before you're ever aware of them. You know, with VR headsets like Oculus, we are mapping inside our homes. If you put it on, it will ask you to map your space. What's it doing with that data? We don't know. Um, so this is a really, really important point for us to think about the metaverse that we want and uh, in that context to think about how we can fix what's broken about web 2 and make sure that we can imbue the metaverse with the kind of principles that of course we already hold dear within web 3. so put simply and of course it's not quite this simple and i'll expand upon it a little bit later but there are crudely two versions of the metaverse emerging. There is only one metaverse, but there are perhaps two pathways or, or there are kind of two ends of the spectrum. Um, one dominated by closed proprietary platforms owned by big tech and others built on open source protocols and principles such as Decentraland and many that will be already, I'm sure, close to our hearts within Web3. But as I said, it's not binary. It's not open or closed, just like it's not centralized or decentralized. Um, and I think open is more important term than decentralized because actually it extends well into um, making sure that much of the software that is being used, for example, with hardware devices is open source. Unfortunately, there's already a very strong open source drive within um, even the more kind of closed platform parts of the metaverse. Um, but there's also another dimension to assess this on. It's not, I don't believe, as important as open and closed, um, but, it, but it reinforces it. And this is hi-fi to lo-fi. So there are um, hardware devices and, of course, the software component to that, which are pushing the experience of the metaverse to kind of draw more people into it, to, to buy these devices, to pay for content. 
Um, but of course, that is only a very small percentage of the global population now and maybe for the next decade that we'll be able to constantly experience that hi-fi version of the metaverse. Um, and that's why it's important that there is a, this also lo-fi instance. So where it is the, the kind of accessibility, lowering the friction, the economic barrier to participate is prioritized over user experience. I think crypto voxels again is a good example of that. And the reason why I think projects like crypto voxels are important is because the, if we go back to the definition of a metaverse, this kind of economic system that enjoys supremacy to fiat systems and the nation state, then that economic system needs to be as inclusive as possible, both globally, socially, and on any spectrum that you like to consider it. So now we've tried to define the metaverse generally. Um, I'm going to talk about the open metaverse. I'm going to propose why I believe Web3 serves as an operating system for a more open metaverse. Um, and you know, as I've said previously, it's not that we believe everything will be open. Necessarily, everything should be open. Um, you know, working in Accelerator, we appreciate pragmatism. We appreciate certainly in early stage startups the ability to discover product market fit to be relatively centralized. Um, but at the same time, and we, we kind of buy into this progressive decentralization, which I know not, not everybody subscribes to. Um, but for us, it is important that there is experimentation in approach of how open or when or where one should be open. But putting that aside, beginning part of this year, when we were thinking about the metaverse, you know, we we're starting to see these innovations happening um, within NFT and virtual worlds and, and uh, gaming and blockchain gaming. Um, we wanted to come up with a framework to be able to assess the openness of a given instance of the metaverse, which we would call a verse. Um, uh, also a kind of way to build out or design for a verse to, to be more open and again, um, on a kind of pathway. So this is kind of the beginnings of a framework. We called it the Open Metaverse OS. You can find the paper on our website, outlaventures.io. But as you can see in the top left, it starts with the user and the user's persona because the difference for us in the Open Metaverse as opposed to the closed Metaverse is that it is user-centric. It is not biased towards the platform and their shareholders. It is biased towards the user um, and they give permission and they are in control of all of these things that you can see in black. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't a platform. That doesn't mean there won't be platforms. But what it means is the platform is subordinated to the user. Platforms will exist. We invest, we invest and will continue to invest in several every year that are kind of bundling together elements within this stack and making it usable or applying it in, for a particular experience or vertical use case. But that platform and that platform will charge a fee but it only does so where it is delivering value. And ideally the user can leave and they can take with them all of these things, or at least some of these things. Um, and so that could be, you know, content, data, and metadata associated metadata. Um, it's also, you know, who's in control of the economics of the system? You know, are they able to be manipulated from a currency perspective? Um, what are the rules of the marketplace? Um, we start to look at kind of the assets associated to the user, their objects, avatars, spaces, 3D models, all these kind of things. Um, who is in control of the physics of the verse? You know, who is in control of identity? Um, who's in control of reputation? Are these assets? Is the identity, is the associated uh, data to that identity portable and transferable? But it also goes all the way down to the infrastructure that enables that experience, both in terms of cloud and compute. So what you might call, you know, this kind of cloud infrastructure, we're already seeing lots of innovation coming through in Web3 that allows for more decentralized instances of these things. So it might be that you have, um, like most of Web3 now, a reliance upon relatively um, centralized and kind of closed systems around your kind of cloud architecture. Um, and you may choose to kind of control 
um, very tightly the experience and, and kind of who can create characters rather than user generated content. Um, but you might want to allow for transferability of an asset once it's been minted on the platform. Um, and one kind of important thing as well is for this to be truly an anatomy of the metaverse, you need, need to enable these kind of bridges between virtual and physical. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so again, we're not expecting or necessarily even proposing that that whole every single instance of every verse is blue, blue here denominating open and kind of shared. But what we expect to happen is um, that with every verse that comes along, whether it's an established verse um, like Fortnite or an entirely new franchise that's developed native to Web3, there will be increased levels of interoperability, increased sharing of standards, increased transferability of assets. Um, and, you know, we can kind of begin to already see that play out in NFT marketplaces. You know, you might uh, participate in a primary sale on one marketplace, but you'll choose to transfer that asset into uh, a different secondary market where you could resell it or go and do something in DeFi and fractionalize it. And that's all possible because of the adoption of these standards. The same with identity. Um, you know, this idea that you can log in with MetaMask um, across any of these platforms. And this is kind of just the beginning of what we believe um, will extend well outside of what we would traditionally define as Web3, um, both across the metaverse, and we would argue that kind of extends uh, across the wider web. Um, so I won't go into to all of these here, but for, for each one of these elements, there are already several examples um of where this is possible now some of this technology might be fairly nascent um some of it might struggle to scale but kind of because of the composability of this it's not reliant upon any one protocol um any one bit of technology um and therefore the the kind of ecosystem as a whole can find workarounds can develop new primitives um uh, and and that kind of accelerates i believe the open version of the metaverse over what might otherwise have to be developed by a single corporation or a small group of corporations. Um, and so, you know, I mentioned earlier, you've got anything from Filecoin for storage, you know, QDOS for compute. I know Boson Protocol, one of our portfolio are there with you um, in Paris. They're working on this physical to digital redemption. Um, which, as I said, is critical for this being a, a true metaverse. It has to extend into the physical um, world. But then, of course, um, a, a platform may take on an entirely new meaning um, with implementations of DAOs. We believe this year, um, just based upon the deal flow that comes with us, as I said, we'll probably have about 2,500 startups applied to the accelerator um, this year. Um, and that gives us this really unique window on the market where we can see what's coming at us from early stage startups. Um, and there's a, a huge amount of interest coming from DAOs, especially in the context of NFTs and the metaverse. So um, we may entirely redefine what it means to be a platform um, versus what we experience in Web2. So ultimately what I'm proposing is that we believe with time, an open metaverse built on shared open source protocols, this kind of open infrastructure um, will allow and have a single unifying yet open financial system. That doesn't necessarily mean that all of that economic activity uh, happens or consolidates on any one protocol, but in combination as part of a stack that's interoperable, um, it can be thought of as one open economic system. And we believe that will erode or eat using the A16 software eats the world kind of vernacular and eventually replace closed platforms due to this powerful network effects that we gain um, from tokenized systems. And so, you know, if you look at what we've seen with either Bitcoin or Ethereum, that the power of tokens as incentives to bootstrap um, this kind of open infrastructure, this decentralized systems, um, is incredibly powerful. 
Um, and of course, we'll extend across uh, the whole of that open metaverse OS stack. Um, in, in the same way, it's mobilized billions of dollars of capital to go into you know, hardware to effectively secure these networks. We believe the same will be true um, for many other levels of that open metaverse OS. Um, and actually, this is really in line with how you would think of the metaverse. The metaverse has always been thought of in a gaming context. And of course, that's, I believe, low hanging fruit. But actually, through tokenization and game theory, really what we're doing is we're gamifying the web. We're gamifying the metaverse, the open metaverse. But of course, the open metaverse for me um, is effectively what the web is becoming, has become, or, or will become. So in an evolutionary sense, it, it could be said that the open metaverse OS, um, by, by leveraging, by virtual worlds leveraging the open metaverse OS, they become pregnant with Web3. And I don't mean pregnant with just the technologies, but those principles, those principles of self-sovereignty, of identity, data, and wealth. Um, and of course, this is you know, now more important um, than ever, as I described previously. So where do we go with that? Like, so that's like a high level framework, like what's the go to market for the open metaverse? What's the low hanging fruit? Well, it's actually important here to kind of just reflect on what's going on in the world of DeFi and, and maybe to define what I mean by MetaFi. So for me, MetaFi is when there's two ways of looking at it. Um, and the term was co coined by a lady called um, Rumi Morales, who's a partner at Outlier Ventures based in the US. And the way that we've kind of developed this thinking is really um, MetaFi is both when DeFi um, can be leveraged or deployed within the metaverse. But again, if you think about what the metaverse is, it's this um, economic system that enjoys supremacy to all other fiat-based, nation-based systems. Therefore, you could argue it becomes the meta economy. And so, you know, I'd argue what we're building with DeFi um, when applied to the metaverse and when combined with NFTs, NFTs as forms of collateral, but also as incentive mechanisms um, that just happen to be non-fungible rather than fungible, um, then we end up with um, MetaFi. And I think MetaFi is the most interesting thing that anybody could be working on in DeFi right now, because you know, there's a lot of attention and focus on, well, how do we make DeFi accepted by regulators? Uh, how do we allow for institutions to use it? And you know, these are all great things to do. We also invest in startups that, that do those, but they're operating on a much longer time horizon. You know, for many of you who already know, like if you've ever tried to get a government or a large company, a com incumbent of any kind to begin to adopt this stuff, you know, I've been in the space near a decade, it's, it's very painful um, and it's almost not worth doing. Um, and so, you know, rather than trying to um, integrate these, these kind of incumbents into DeFi, I actually think the low hanging fruit is to look at how can DeFi be deployed in the context of the metaverse. And I'm going to expand upon that a little bit later. Um, but let, let's define what I mean by that a little bit more. So for me, the kind of two characteristics. Um, one of them is unstoppability in that it can't be controlled by a single centralized entity, going back to that dystopic um, definition that I offered around Ready Player One, um, and that it is user centric. Um, so that means the user is in control, but also the value is better distributed to where it is created. Um, and that is generally not the platform. The platform might be the venue. Um, but it is not the source of creative output. Um, and so we are looking for systems that bias towards distribution of value. And again, this is the great thing about leveraging the power of DeFi because it is both of these things, you know, it is both unstoppable and it has this um, almost insatiable thirst to remove inefficiencies um, and to try to deliver yield. So to reward um, creation or, or positive participation in the system um, and to remove um, rent seeking or, or burdensome rent seeking. And so 
Metafy solves for two problems, the application of DeFi into the metaverse. It stops for, and this is not new news in the context of Web3, of course, but platform monopolization. So again, coming back to this idea of um, value creation in the metaverse today or the web generally, whether it's search, social, e-commerce, streaming or gaming, generally the platform, uh, the venue where value is created um, takes all or almost all of that value and very little is given to the creator. Um, and therefore, you know, often this is thought of around the kind of creator or creative economy. Um, and what's really exciting is through our accelerator now, we're starting to see brilliant applications of new forms of social media that reward the creator economy, but be that influencers, bloggers, vloggers, um, we're seeing, of course, in, in the blockchain gaming environments, this idea of increased user-generated content where, unlike, say, Roblox, where I think it's close to 80% of all value is divided between a number of stakeholders other than the actual creator of games. So we're going to see uh, much greater forms of user-generated content, both in terms of indie developers all the way down to actual users. Um, now, the reason why this is really important is if you think about the billions, trillions of dollars of value that's created across those areas today um, that goes to corporations and their shareholders rather than the creators of that value, um, even the slim bit of value that does go to that end user barely forms an income, at least a stable income. Um, but that aside, if you think about all the value that's currently locked in these platforms, this is value that can't be monetized. It can't be moved out of that platform. So if you invest in something, if you invest in Instagram, your time and energy in Instagram, or you invest that in a particular game, um, it only really, that value only really exists in that environment. It can't, be, uh, it can't be taken out of it. It can't be sold. It can't be monetized. But more importantly, it can't be used as collateral. And so if you think about there are whole generations now, I mean, I'm 40, but I know if I look at my daughter and you know how she interacts with media and the internet and, and the kind of people that she follows um, and the kind of younger founders that are coming to, to our accelerator, you know, the, there will be whole generations whose primary form of wealth, and I'm not talking about crypto, I'm talking about other forms of wealth, will be digital. Um, and they can't go to a bank. They can't get a loan against that. Um, they can't get a mortgage on a house. You know, you could have a million dollars worth of gaming skins. No bank is going to lend to you for that. But DeFi can and DeFi will. Um, and the idea that this value can extend beyond any one platform becomes incredibly powerful. Because when creations, wealth and assets have a life off platform and can be uh, exchanged almost infinitely between themselves. You know, I could use my reputation on Instagram as a, to, to apply for credit in DeFi on something else. I can use access to that account um, as collateral. So it's not just about creating new forms of digital value that are purely native and on a blockchain already. It's actually looking at all the value that's currently trapped um, in Web2 and gaming platforms um, that we could somehow unlock. And the really interesting thing is we don't even necessarily need the permission of the platform because we can create synthetics. We can create derivatives. We could have representation on chain representations of off chain value that exists within web two. And we could allow for that to be borrowed and lent against or exchanged. And so because of this openness, because of this, um, the dynamism that's then allowed between exchanging value across platform um, and then combining that with the idea that most native platforms in the open metaverse by default allow you to transfer value, we end up with something you could consider value squared. And so that's why I believe the open metaverse will win out over the closed metaverse. And we can already begin to see um, the beginnings of this and what you might call Metafy 1.0, again, many of these projects you'll, you'll already be aware of, whether it's play to earn with axes and gaming, whether it's OpenSea and the digital art platforms, whether it's data monetization um, through IDOs, initial data offerings and Ocean, um, virtual worlds, 
Um, but even things like um, meme assets. So we ha had a project called meme.com go through the accelerator. They launched the network um, a few months ago. And if you think about the meme economy, memes drive the majority of attention on the internet. Most platforms make huge amounts of advertising revenue around memes, but nobody actually monetizes memes themselves, not the creators, not the remixes, not the people that um, participate in it going viral. And so they've done something which is kind of at the most bonkers end of the open metaverse, which is to allow for a memetic asset protocol where you can effectively um, uh, create tokens associated to memes and you could trade them based upon the the direction of that meme uh, and then you can participate by uh, marbling and bookmarking so um you know when these things these assets begin to be combined into Aave compound yearn um we can create as i said derivatives of off-chain assets um but that are yet still digital um, through things like synthetics um we can start to create indices um for combinations of these things all of a sudden, um, this is the most inclusive financial system that we've ever experienced. And any form of value creation um, uh, that is digital can immediately be deployed, borrowed against, um, and turned into a, a meaningful form of wealth um, within Metafy. Um, and yet we've just got started. And so these are like several areas that we're actively looking at investing in. Um, whether that's, you know, tools that allow for the fractionalization of NFTs, uh, of course, interoperability across that stack where things that can improve liquidity, um, a big thing now is data and off the back of that price discovery of NFTs, how can you begin to fully quantify the value of an NFT um, beyond a very crude understanding of a, of a floor? Um, so. You know, that's kind of the vision around the open metaverse, Metify. Metify, as I say, we believe there are, there are many great things you can be doing with DeFi, but we believe the low hanging fruit is applying it in the context of the metaverse, both native um, assets and kind of over the top going into um, creating derivatives for um, off, off chain assets. Um, so finally, I just want to kind of close off by introducing you to, to Basecamp, encouraging you to apply to join us and our portfolio in the mission of creating an open metaverse OS. As I said, we're nearing 100 startups in that now, um, ranging from you know very uh, low level protocols, primitives, solving for digital to physical redemption or whatever it may be, data marketplaces, um, all the way through to DeFi infrastructure, um, and of course, innovations around NFTs, royalties, price discovery, et cetera. Um, but, you know, we're now at the stage where we're um, actively recruiting again. We're effectively perpetually recruiting. Um, we're running parallel programs, both our kind of uh, protocol agnostic accelerator, which is um, base camp proper. And then we also have several ecosystem accelerators that we're running. We've just announced one um, with Filecoin. We've got several more um, in the pipes. And effectively, we help you early stage projects. Early stage doesn't mean that you are you just have to be a couple of people um, with an MVP. We, we have had spin outs from uh, large, very large organizations. We've had startups that have already raised you know, series A and B but that want to begin to explore either fungible or non-fungible um, tokens, how that can optimize uh, their technology, how can it allow them to open source more of that technology. Um, and we've kind of got all the competencies that you would require there from regulatory oversight and advice from securities lawyers through to how you select your technology stack, your pathway around governance, decent around decentralization, and all these various things. Um, Finally, um, we're currently recruiting to Filecoin Accelerator. So if you are using either Filecoin IPFS in any way at all, but especially around the financialization of the open data economy, NFT experience and metaverse persistence, or Cloud 2.0, not just storage, but also compute, um, then both Outlier and Filecoin will give you money and both of us will help accelerate you leveraging our combined ecosystem. So we're actively recruiting for that now. Um, and you can apply to both the protocol agnostic or the Basecamp 
um, Filecoin Accelerator through the same URL, outliveengines.io uh, slash Basecamp. Um, we've got many of the leading Web3 founders who come on as mentors um, and do drop-ins. You can see many of them on what was the founders of Web3 podcast, which is now the Metaverse show, um, where I've introduced, I've interviewed over 80 of them to date, and many of those uh, come and uh, are mentors in the Accelerator. And then finally, and thank you for um, giving me a few moments to do this, um, we have our graduation day for the latest cohort, which is next week. Um, and you can come along that's free. It's a virtual event. Um, and we have several panels with uh, leading investors and founders from across Web3 alongside the graduating portfolio companies. And this year, we've got some brilliant people from Epic Games, Galaxy Digital. Um, we've got Brown from Protocol Labs and IPFS, Robbie from Animoca. So um, please do go to the URL um, below. You could also go to diffusion.events. Uh, sign up there. It'll be a two-day conference, and we'd, we'd love to see you there. So that is it from me. I don't know how I did for time um, or whether we've got time for Q&A. &A. Sure. Sure. Thanks for the question. Well, firstly, um, you sound like a very Metafy project, so um, you should definitely apply. Um, and, you know, coming back to this lo-fi, hi-fi, I, I love the idea of pixelated worlds because, again, it, it just allows um, more people to enter these economic systems. Um, and I think gameplay is a great way to make DeFi more accessible, at, you know, and, and I think there are several projects that have shown that from Arvid Gotche, and, and so that all sounds really, really exciting. Um, so Basecamp specifically, you know, we're, the money in and of itself is really a stipend, you know, so for most projects, um, as I said, we generally work with early stage projects, but we have some that enter the program. They've already raised, you know, half a million, a million, some several million. They're not necessarily coming to us directly for the money. Um, what they're coming into the program for us is um, both to do a lot of like conventional startup stuff. So not necessarily to treat, you know, teach you how to be a founder, but to look at product market fit, to develop the pitch and to help you fundraise and to help you fundraise at a high valuation, you know, more money at a high valuation more quickly. Um, but then also there's kind of the nuances, of course, of being a metaverse startup, which is, you know, thinking around the, the mix or the role of equity, fungible and non-fungible tokens in terms of where value accrues 
how you're going to finance um, your organization. Uh, alongside that, thinking around governance, you know, pathways to decentralization. Um, and, you know, a, a big part of what we do with Basecamp is ready projects to go into something we call Ascent. Ascent is where we work with later stage networks who have already closed several million um, and based on a readiness score are anything from six to, to kind of 12 weeks away from token launch. So we kind of, Basecamp is about using that mounting and uh, mounting analogy to ready you for, for that. And if you go through Basecamp subject to being meeting the readiness score, you can also go through Ascent. It's all included in the same terms. We do also take third party projects directly into Ascent, but they have to be very progressed. Um, but I guess kind of the way that I would answer the question with, with limited amount of time, you know, so we've got Accelerator is about two things. One, internal competency. You know, we've got over 30 people now um, who've done this a lot. Uh, working with projects in every dimension, whether that's selecting technology stack, thinking through governance, token design, um, you know, the launch of a token, um, how you do that in a compliant way, um, and these kind of things. Um, but actually, uh, we also then have this very large extended network. We've got over 1,500 investors now from all the top tier one VCs, both crypto native and, and otherwise through to community pools and um and DAOs. Um, and so we effectively get you in front of those right people many of those investors see us as a filter of how they engage with the market of course they don't exclusively invest through us but um, they know if it's gone through the program firstly it got selected and we do a lot of due diligence but then we've helped refine it and de-risk it for that investor and that's what allows the project to raise more money and kind of finally how i describe it is um, there's a lot to do as a Web3 founder. I would say an order of magnitude greater than a traditional founder. There's just so many more things you have to consider when you're launching um, uh, a startup in this space. Um, and it's very difficult for you to have all of those competencies in house as a startup. You know, like you're lucky if you've got a handful of people. Um, and often you're just trying to do the basic startup stuff, you know, which is like acquire users, acquire customers, manage fundraising, um, not run out of money. Um, and so effectively, how I describe it is, you know, what would take a project perhaps 12 to 24 months to, to kind of build up the competencies, to work through these things, to have the learning curve, to build the networks and relationships, we fast track all of that. So we know all the exchanges, we know all the investors, you know, we know the token engineers that you need to, to meet with. And we know the community pools that you should work with and how and how you should structure that. Um, and so effectively in startup world, time is money. I think I said in the presentation, 90% of startups fail um, generally, um, and most of them run out of money in their first year. Um, so time is money and we shorten, we both get you more money and we shorten the time you spend on solving the problems and launching a network and stuff. Um, so I believe like the combination of those things makes us good, good value for money. But what I would always say is, um, you know, speak to our portfolio. They're our best advocates. Increasingly, we try to speak through them and their success. Good luck, guys. Have fun.